How to Make Our Mental Pictures Come True, a series of easy lessons in the art of visualizing by George Schubel. Part 3, Technique of Visualizing. Chapter 8, Our Thought Impression in Solution. We now consider our imaged thought as having passed into the developing room of subconsciousness. To that, place in mind or state of mind which precludes all outer vibrations of objective thinking. Let us remember that at this time of transference of our thought image, we are resting quietly and in an entirely relaxed attitude mentally and physically. We have entered into a subjective mental condition, becoming as nearly passive as possible and refraining from any further thinking upon our impressed thought image. There is no need for it. The light of our understanding has passed from the objective phase of mind and is slowly and gently submerging itself in the chemical developing solution of our subsense consciousness. The student remembers at this moment what our impressed thought really is. It is a specialized form of mental light, the light of our understanding, which has become infilmed or impressed and now has become sunk in the very deep of our individualized subsense consciousness where it becomes a center of attraction for the infinitely inconceivable polarized mentoids which are contained in this chemical solution of mind. Resting in our passive or subjective attitude, a great calm comes over us at this moment a great feeling of assurance and peace, and in most instances we fall into a restful natural sleep. That is as it should be. In the few moments in which the transference has occurred, the outer faculties have performed their function. The inner subjective and subconscious phase of mind is now at work and further formulation of our mental picture of the money, the business, and the home has begun. A law of development is at work. It is not our individualized objective consciousness which is now busy with our career, but our subjective consciousness working upon and worked upon by our understanding which is now gathering together for itself and around its delicate form of light the further mental chemical structure for its outward manifestation. Our objective attitude of mind from this point on becomes, as we know, simply one of cooperation. And this cooperation is exemplified best when our thinking and acting in all our daily outward affairs is directed continually in ways which will facilitate the development of our thought. We must have an understanding faith in the outcome of our developing picture. We must henceforth be true and loyal to the subjective forces working for us. We must be mentally alert to their direction. We must be patient. We must help by getting into the spirit of our picture. We must love it as it were into existence. But separate from this, we know that a movement of the underlying natural forces of the substance of our subconscious thinking or mind solution now has been started in motion, carrying our projected understanding or thought with them, not only to the very depths of our own individualized subconsciousness, but to all other minds which are for the moment subjectively conditioned to our thinking, until our thought is carried out and submerged into the very ocean of universal subsense consciousness, attracting unto itself not only other thoughts, but taking hold on the subsense side of all those things, circumstances, conditions, and persons that are to be a part of its outward fulfillment. End of chapter 8. Chapter 9. Reviewing our developing picture from time to time. The whole mental mechanical and, to an extent, the mental chemical process connected with the visualizing of our career has perhaps taken from 10 to 30 minutes of quiet contemplation and reflection in our silence room, depending upon the time which we have taken to get comfortably settled and to concentrate upon our object. 
Now, however, since our thought image is submerged not only in our individualized subconsciousness, but in the universal subconsciousness of which our own is an inseparable part, it becomes a matter of development which may take hours, days, and even years to fulfill itself, depending upon certain mental laws which we apply as well as upon the various modifications of those agencies which will introduce themselves and which include ourselves, other minds, and those circumstances and conditions to which we must react, even though we subjectively control them. For this reason, we have ample time from day to day to go into our darkened room, which we now term our developing room, Settling ourselves as comfortably as possible, letting ourselves relapse into the subjective state completely, and spending as much time there as we find our moods and daily affairs will allow. In these moments, we mentally lift our infilmed thought of our career from its subjective bath and quietly meditate upon it and review its progress subjectively, always remembering, however, that our examination of our mental picture is possible at any time and anywhere, at a railroad station, in a train, or while at work. And if we are true to our picture, we will find ourselves doing this, as we said before, without being consciously aware of the fact. End of chapter 9. Chapter 10. Watching for Outward Indications. Day by day, or night by night, in our quiet room, or wherever and whenever we enter mentally into the subjective contemplation of our developing thought, we find ourselves patiently and lovingly and yet vigilantly watching for the first early outward indications and traces of our developing picture, knowing that here as elsewhere we must learn to labor and wait. If we are anxious, it is now not the anxiety implied by fear or worry or doubt about the outcome, but rather an attitude which is best described as an attitude of eager expectancy, hard to restrain. If we are intense, it is not the nervous tension or tenseness of impatience, but rather an eagerness to know how our reproduction fares, and we know or should know that it fares well. Alone in our subdued and darkened room, which is the best place for reviewing the progress of our picture, we sit and examine the outward appearing evidence of it, remembering that our developing understanding really is launched forth now beyond the circumscribed and limited scope of individualized subconsciousness, beyond the limits of ourselves as units of mind light, and that it is developing as an infilmed form of mental light in that great universal everywhere of subjective subconsciousness, of which we are an inseparable part, formulating a structure of infinitely delicate texture out of this body-forming substance every moment and every hour now. Realizing as we do that our submerged understanding is now precipitated in this ocean of chemicalized mind substance which underlies and pervades all conditions and all circumstances of this outward world, we watch for indications everywhere and in everything, looking upon friends, relatives, strangers, books, words, occasions, and all else which seemingly happens to come within the developing area of our outward forming picture, but which in reality is attracted to it by the developing law which is at work. Unexpected persons, perhaps from a distance, have affinity or subjective kinship to our thought of money, business, and home, now come to us in a seemingly miraculous manner. Seemingly trifling bits of information drift into our daily affairs. Casual words are said, books are loaned to us, letters are received, and a hundred and one incidents of a like kind transpire, which manifest solely for the purpose of becoming a part of our forming picture. As we quietly and meditatively review our picture with this fact in mind, we find perhaps a first faint indication of its outward development in the appearance of a distant friend who comes into our lives and whom we have not seen in many years, or a stranger we have never seen before, 
or in the form of an unexpected letter or in the form of a casual introduction at the club or elsewhere. The distant friend may have returned as a man or woman of means and in the course of a conversation may casually mention the fact that he or she has some $5,000 in cash for investment. Probably we are asked if we know of a good local proposition and instantly the remark relates itself to our own need for $5,000. The stranger may be looking to enter into a business in our part of the city or town which is similar to that which our own thought is concerned. The unexpected letter may contain a check which will serve as an initial payment on the merchandise necessary for our business, and our casual introduction may lead to a further introduction to a cashier or director of a bank who can provide the needed finances. Even while the picture of our money and business is forming itself in this wise, the associated object of a home for which our business will provide the means is also forming itself in perhaps a very remote, though nonetheless tangible way. Someone may give us some tapestries, someone a beautiful set of dishes, a catalog of homes may come to us as the most remote indication, and so as we watch our outworking thought from day to day, taking account of it as it were, we find our career is beginning to work out most wonderfully, yet simply just as we had pictured it. There is nothing remarkable, mystical, supernatural, or even unusual about this working out of our picture. It simply is a chain of sequences or consequences which are continually entering into and passing out of our lives unnoticed, except that in deliberate visualizing, we become keenly conscious and alert as to their appearance and presence, and in this recognition, we make the most out of them as we should. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11. Strengthening Our Developing Thought. We must remember that our mental chemical developing formula calls for the introduction of all the developing agents which will serve to bring out our picture in all its clearest and finest details and in the quickest possible time, so that we bring to the developing process all the interest, all the joy, all the gladness that a keen anticipation implies. In a word, it calls for feeling, and every bit of feeling that we possibly can generate and discharge now into the developing solution of subconsciousness strengthens it. We must enter into the spirit of our picture, for this is what our picture actually is, spirit. And by spirit, we mean that true substance of which we have spoken throughout our lessons and from which all things whatsoever hidden or revealed are formed. We must get into the livingness of our career. We must feel its magnetic warmth, its life, remembering the fact that with this mental chemical modification we are bringing into outward manifestation now, not that which has no life, but that which is life. We get into the feeling of our picture and facilitated activity of development innerly, not merely by using our imagination, but by our actual outward sense of touch. While seated quietly in our developing room, we take several bills of any denomination and pass them from one hand to the other, just as the bank teller does in counting out bills which he receives or hands out through the little window. We feel the texture of the bills, we feel their smoothness or roughness, as the case may be, and in this way the inward reality of our feeling finds itself more quickly corresponding to the outward reality into which our thought of money is shaping itself. So, with the business which we are developing mentally, if it is an automobile business, then we want to know how it feels to handle a prospective customer, and so we talk to our friends and try to sell them a machine. We wax enthusiastic about the car to such a point where our friends will almost be ready to buy the automobile on the strength of what we say. We can, if we choose, offer our services to some sales concern without charge if necessary, and in this way, we not only feel our way into the business, but we get into the spirit of the selling game as it is called. 
In doing this, we must feel the happiness, the joy, the interest of selling. We must feel that selling automobiles or whatever other outward form our business is to take is the one thing which we have wanted to do all our lives, and this means that we love it. Let us remember always that our career is formulating, specializing, and providing expression for itself, not only through the brain of us, but through the heart of us also, so that we are introducing into our formula now, not only the elements of interest and joy and gladness, but the element of love, the element which, charged into subconsciousness, contains not only the warmth, but the mothering and nurturing qualities as well. Happy indeed are we if we are able to make this mental chemical charge of love into our subconscious developing solution a great and overwhelming one. A love for our career that will dissolve any element not related to it and fix our career in a manner which will make it permanent and true. Knowing the worthy purpose for which our money is desired. We are able to transmute and chemicalize our thought of it until our love enters into its very metal when it makes its outward appearance in our career. So with our business, knowing the worthy purpose which it is to serve in providing the means of happiness for others, we come to love it even before it has materialized outwardly. And in a similar manner, we feel the greatest love toward the thought of our home. We go to a furniture establishment and there thrill inwardly as we lovingly handle piece after piece of furniture or this or that rug, which we feel and know will be ours in a little while to come, even as it is already ours in spirit. Or we walk about in other homes and say to ourselves, this is how my home shall be, saying it not only lovingly, but with all the feeling, conviction, and assurance which our understanding faith has given unto us. The more of this element of love for our career, which we can continually pour into the solution of our subconsciousness, the more responsive, giving, and yielding its forming substance will be to our attracting thought, which is taking shape in it, and the more fixed and permanent will the outcome be, for this is the power and nature of love. Let us feel toward our whole developing career the same great and overwhelming love, the same joy of anticipation, which thrills and floods the being of the expectant mother, remembering rejoicingly that the enfilmed light of our best understanding, our best wisdom, is sunk in the only real substance that is or ever will be, and that it is there incarnating itself into that which from now on will make itself more and more evident outwardly in our lives, until the day when our money, our business, and our home, or whatever else in this life we choose to see, becomes an outwardly accomplished fact. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12. Conclusion. We would feel remiss, indeed, if we concluded these lessons without offering to the student a higher concept of the purpose of visualizing than that which generally is accepted as justification for the use of the visualizing power. We hold this power to be holy and divine, a form of the one and only power which is, and in this thought we feel that its use should be consecrated serving first in the divine unfoldment of ourselves in good, and then through us serving in the unfoldment of the good in all. The very best and the very highest that we can ever hope to obtain by the use of visualizing can never carry us beyond this twofold object. In fact, the whole photographic apparatus of the mind, its imaging and formulating devices, as well as the mental chemical process of development, can only serve and must, even though unconsciously, serve this high purpose in the end. How much better then to carry out this object in a conscious way, knowing that we are using this power for the very divine purpose of visualizing ourselves into all that we want to be or do or have in good, and knowing further that in picturing ourselves thus in good, we are outpicturing ourselves in God. In the very highest sense, we are not only outpicturing ourselves in God, 
but God is outpicturing himself in us and through us. The more unselfish we make our object in visualizing, the more will this divine unfoldment manifest itself to us in the outward good or God of all. It is with this highest concept in mind that we leave the student to apply his or her knowledge of visualizing to good ends, confident that the outcome of the picture conceived in good cannot be anything else but successful in its outward reproduction. End of chapter 12. In the same manner in which this book has served your purpose, so let it serve the purpose of others whom you would like to help by having them read it. Pass it on. The end of How to Make Our Mental Pictures Come True by George Schubel, narrated by Rex King.